Welcome to the OC24 podcast, where we've taken some of the best talks and discussions from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime, which showcases some of the most interesting research into organised crime around the world. This episode is called Devolution, Urban Growth Role and the Surge of Gangs in Kenya. Welcome to this meeting where we get to discuss devolution, urban growth and the surge of gangs in Kenya. My name is Esther Njeri, and I'm the chairperson at Art for Rights, a Kenyan-based organization that uses art to spread awareness on social justices and advancement of human rights in Kenya. <laughs> in collaboration with the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, GTOC, under the Resilience Fund, we commissioned an investigative interview series on a criminal gang dubbed confirmed and kind, and kind of activities they are involved in. We interviewed the current and former gang members, victims who have fallen prey, uh, who have fallen prey to this. Our first panelist is, is Mohamed Mwini. He's a founder of Al Mwini Technologies and a strategist for several successful community initiative that turned young young and creative, innovative, successful startups. He is part of the dream team of Youth Bilanoma. Okay, welcome, Mwini. Thank you yeah. for the intro. My name is Mohamed Mwini. Okay. Uh, I work for with and uh, with Youth Bilanoma. Yeah, and uh, basically our work is uh, strengthening community resilience. Uh, and we work closely with the uh, risk youth uh, in the informal settlements, especially those uh, in the, who are engaged maybe in crime, especially the uh, confirmed gang. And uh, basically, from our interaction, we saw that uh, from the video also, most of them, they are unemployed and they need to be supported. And because uh, in Nakuru, Due to the rapid urbanization and influx of so, so many people, there has been a lot that has been happening. So many youth are engaging in crime. Uh, some are pushed by their peers. Some are be, because of the uh, school dropouts. Uh, some, mostly, they, it's because of unemployment. As youth Bilanoma, we saw that it's a good uh, opportunity, though so it's sad that uh, they're engaging in crime, but also we saw that there are some push and pull factors that contributes to uh, their behaviors. Some of them have been experiences, adverse childhood exper uh, experiences since they were born. And some were pushed maybe by police brutality and some maybe uh, due to mental health challenges. So as Youth Bilanoma, we've been trying to help those uh, in need, especially those at risk youth, uh, through sport and art. That's, why, that's how we came across Art for Rights. And we are happy to see such an organization work, working towards uh, uh, helping those uh, at risk youth. And uh, it's good that today we have this voice because we believe that these young people, if we engage them uh, correctly, they are going to be good citizens and they're going to do good job. Because we saw that some were pushed due to unemployment. And that's why we empowered some to come up with the uh, income generating activity through our initiatives, such as the Beziangu Talks, whereby we go to those areas like Bondeni, we listen to them, we talk to them, they tell us their challenges, we try as, as much as possible to incorporate even the government uh, agencies that maybe uh, they affect directly those at risk. So we try to merge the gap because some of them, they believe that the government uh, the government is support it's not supporting them because already they feel they are left out. So we decided to work with them because they are good citizens as much as they are engaging in crime. There are some push and pull, pull factors. We cannot fight them. We cannot keep chasing them every day. So that's why we decided to engage them, sit down with them, try to understand them, the challenges that they are facing. Uh, plus after understanding the challenges they are facing, we try to inform them through capacity building sessions, 
Then after that, we try to come up with empowerment sessions whereby at least we try to bridge the gap for some of them they are illiterate. And that's why we thank some organizations such as Midri, whereby they decided to take some dropouts back to school, the technical institution, like uh, that for Nakuru Polytechnic. And we saw that some of them chose different courses, they graduated from those courses, and now they are earning their living. Some we even went ahead to fill uh, like the kelp. Kenya Youth Employment Opportunity. Some of them, we even sat with them and asked them, what do you like to do? Some of them, they are artists, they do beadwork. We try as much as possible to resource mobilize from our local uh, uh, well-wishers. They donate to them the beads. And uh, we saw that some of them, eventually they started changing, but we saw there is a lot to be done. Because some of them, they are already addicts. They saw, they went maybe through drug uh, and substance abuse. That's why they've been engaging, like the confirmed gang. They've been engaging in, in most of the crime due to maybe the influence of the drug that they are, they are taking. Because you will not find anyone who is willing to cut anyone, to kill anyone, a friend. Because uh, recently, what you've seen through the video, some of those uh, confirmed gangs that they were test testifying, we work closely with them. And we even asked them, why did you kill that person? They said, oh, that person maybe tried to disengage from our group. And we saw that he's a traitor. So he decided maybe to act against him. Or maybe they are they revenged for someone who was killed in line uh, in the line of crime. Because they, they live in different areas. And we saw that after the death of Biggie, the person who they mentioned there, uh, he was the one who was trying to control the groups. But after his death, there, is not, there was no leader who was willing to come in to maybe to solve the conflict. That's why we as ASO we need to intervene and start helping those. Because we saw that through our help, they are willing and uh, they are willing to change and they are willing to pass positive narratives, which, which are going to promote social cohesion in their communities, because already they are divided. Some cannot even visit other places. And that's why they use motorbikes to go and drop when they are not able to do the cyber crimes. And if we, we can't support them, they're going to continue the, the same trend. And we have to work closely with them so that we can understand what's next. Because now that we are in Nakuru city, I believe there are so many things that are going to happen. And if we don't control it now, I'm sure we, are not, we will not be able to uh, work with them, even try to uh, listen to them because it's now it's now is the opportunity that we need to understand here uh, these are the challenges that are facing and this is the way to inform them because I'm sure they lack the right information. Some of them, even the, they lost hope and trust in their communities because most of the communities, instead of helping, maybe they are snitching and uh, uh, through their snitching, the police also informed those uh, confirmed leaders like Biggie, he used to know what's happening in Kenya. And uh, he, he tried as much as possible to work with the police, whereby he was giving out uh, the tokens, even though it's corruption, he was trying to curb the fight between the groups. Uh, and the government also, they were not arresting them like now. But nowadays, you see that due to the upside, so many have money, they can bail themselves out, they come back to the society, they attack the residents who reported them. So to cut that, we need to support them, even the police, on how we can come up with a solution. Because I believe our community uh, is our solution. Huh? I think I think I will cut you short. You, it seems you have a lot to say, but I think because of uh, time, I'll cut you short. Ah, uh, it's okay. Uh, uh, can I finish? Okay? Yes. Yeah, one minute. The last shot. Okay, one minute. So one minute. I believe yeah. our communities is our, our solution and our solution is our community. We need to support the community interventions, the group interventions, and the individual interventions, the three levels. Plus, plus also we need to work closely with the government so that they can know the opportunities that are there. Plus also we can influence implementation of those policies that are, are yet to be implemented by our officials 
And also we can elect good leaders in Kenya. And also since we are nearing elections, we need to support even those groups because they are the good soldiers. So unless we do that, we are going to be experiencing a lot and our youth are going to fall. But uh, I believe through our empowerment sessions, we are going to strengthen the community resilience and our youth, they are going to be good advocates in advancing social justice in our community. So let's continue working together, collaborating for a better future, a better Nakuru, a better Kenya, a better world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mwiji. Yeah, that, that was insightful. Uh, I, I will now uh, introduce our next panelist, uh, Beatrice Arusei. Uh, she is the assistant program officer at Midrift Hurinet. She implements the intersectional urban violence prevention program in Nakuru. Uh, she's also a human rights defender and works with the local communities in spearheading peace and security initiative. Beatrice. Hi, Esther, how are you? Yeah, you're welcome. All right, thank you very I, much. I just have you. a question for you. All right. Uh, if if you'll if you'll share with us what you what stood out for the, for you in this documentary, uh, and I'll also I'll also want to know how 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 civil society can partner with the county government in in dealing with the gang problem in Nakuru. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. One thing is what stood out for me in the documentary is how confirm has mutated itself from a criminal network to an organized crime syndicate, like it's a gang right now. So it started, first of all, Confirm was started by a woman who was an ex, who was an ex -Safari, Safaricom employee. And she was, she had been convicted of a crime and she went to prison. So that's where it started. It was started by a woman. And another thing is most of the people think that it's only old people who are involved in, in the confirmed gang, they are older people. Like there's someone who's above 50 and still does the crime, the cyber crime that is confirmed. So another thing that stood out for me is how, if we are not careful, if we do not intervene right now, we are looking at affiliations in the next year because it's the political season in Kenya. So at the end of the day, there'll be affiliations with political leaders and they might be used to, to create chaos in Nakuru and other places. Like let's say the only, uh, the only faction that has an affiliation to another place is let's say the Gaza. Gaza is in Nakuru and has an affiliation to the Gaza in Nairobi. But right now we are looking at how they are going to affiliate themselves to political leaders. And that is, they are going to be used as Mohammed has said, the food soldiers, or is it you who said the food soldiers of, of the violence that might be in the 2022 election. So another thing is maybe that I'll say uh, that has come up and it's something that we really need to take care of, like the cyber crime, uh, cyber crime laws that are not being implemented. I think Joyce mentioned that in the, in the documentary, the cyber crime law. So it has not been implemented or I don't know if it's been assented to a law. So it's not being, uh, it's not, it not being in place it is making it very hard for police officers or the office of the public prosecutor to prosecute these people on, on the basis on the charges of cyber crime. Now they are just prosecuted by the fact that they have they are planted drugs, the police plant drugs on them, or they they are charged with other offenses that is not cyber crime, what they actually do. So it is something that we need to check on how we are able to. Uh, uh, enhance, I'm a lobby the government to enact the cybercrime laws so that they are able to be convicted and also prosecuted. Because right now, when they go to, to, to court, they are prosecuted by, by the mere fact that they have drugs or they are drug users. Uh, another thing that I'll say is uh, the challenges that we faced as Midrift Human Rights Network as we go forward in intervention. One is it's the community protecting them. One of the things is when you find them, like when the police are, are doing raids, community members will protect them because at the end of the day, 
the money they get, it goes back to the community. Like most of the people, may, maybe when you talk to them, they'll say they're paying school fees, they confirm gangs. They are paying school fees for their siblings. They are, they are also uh, making sure that they are, their parents are well taken care of. So at the end of the day, the parents and the community will protect them. So if you're not able to maybe uh, do the, uh, also provide, uh, address the root causes like unemployment and also welfare for the, for the older generation, then this is something that will go on. Another thing is maybe the cor corruption corruption in the security sector, like one is arrested and they are actually, uh, they, they bribe them, themselves out of the court. And sometimes it's their gang leaders who, who are able to bail them out. And it's not bail like the official bail, it's just kitu kidogo for the police officers, for the people, for the gang members to be released. Another challenge is that I have talked about the law implementation of cybercrime law then there is inadequate resource to address the root causes. And that is also where the government come in, like the unemployment, like the basic needs that, uh, like, like water, like we don't have a lot of things going on. The school, school, yes, they say it's free primary school, free secondary school, but, they, but yet they are not able uh, to finish school. Another thing is lack of political goodwill. You see, if the law had been, the, the law has is implemented then we'll be able to to do it to 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 prosecute this uh, these crimes and the the political goodwill and especially let's say from the members of parliament where they they are the one sometimes bailing these people out and also giving them okay encouraging them to go on so it is something that we need to see how maybe we can bring all these sectors together how we can uh, bring partner with the county government to and uh, to also maybe i don't know if nakuru county i think nakuru county does not have a policy or an act that protects the the cyber crime unless we use the national government government uh, policies so another thing is maybe how you can work with the county government because you find so much uh, they are using threats and so far threats do not work as midrift we are using midrift human rights network we are using a soft approach on bringing them uh, closer to us some of them have gone through school and they are doing their first exams this this december others are, are already working and we've been able to work with youth bilanoma that is mohammed Mwenye and his colleagues on how to empower these young people. We are also using psychosocial support because most of them, as Mohammed had said, have gone through advanced childhood experiences and others are going through mental disorders that needs to be taken care of before maybe uh, them getting out of crime. So we are using the mental health uh, psychosocial support and the soft approaches for us to be able to get them close and them to be able to get back to using the doing the legal activities for them to get money and a source of livelihood. Yeah. I think going forward is partnership and partnership, more partnership on how we are able to help these young people because it's something that cannot be done by one organization or even two. It needs a whole sector and collaboration, sector, intersectoral collaboration for us to be able to work and rehabilitate these young men to come back, young men and women to come back and use the and be citizens of of value to the to the country. Yeah, I think maybe that's it. Unless there's another question from from Jerry, I, I we will ask the question at the end of it. So, okay. Uh, let, let me let us first go to our next uh, panelist. Uh, okay, thank you. First, that's an amazing job you're doing, uh, Smith Reeves. Yes, uh, our next panelist is is Willie Oweba. Willie Oweba, karibu sana. <laughs> yes, allow me to introduce you. Yes, our third panelist is Willie Oweba. is an accomplished, award-winning spoken word poet. He's a human rights defender with the, his recent achievement being winning the upcoming Human Rights Defender of the Year 2021. He uses art, he uses, uh, yeah, he uses art to champion the rights of the underprivileged in his community. 
So I have a question for you, Oweba. Um, what, what do you think is the role of spoken word or art that what is what is its role in ensuring that the gangs that gangs that are uprising, especially in the counties, can be curbed? The role of art and spoken word. Welcome, Oweba. We can't hear you, please unmute. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, first to start with, um, in Kenya, more so in Nakuru, uh, it is a crime to be a youth, is a crime because of stereotype, yeah? I have dreadlocks and I was nearly shot in 2017, 21st of January, because they thought I looked like a member of the confirmed group, the confirmed gang. And uh, that is why I transitioned the how I write with my spoken word poetry and how I tell stories with spoken word poetry in an objective to amplify and to change the mindset and revolutionize the mindset of the youth, both uh, the gangs, the criminal gangs and the police, because there, there is a lot that comes with having a um, criminal gang like Confirm in Nakuru, yeah? And, uh, cri and crime and urbanization are, are common in the present world, more so when, like right now, Nakuru is chartered to be a city. And we have three types of crime. There uh, are uh, uh, three theories that, that revolve around why we have uh, criminal gangs in urban centers like Nakuru, yeah? And the first one is uh, social disorganization. And this was done a research in 1930 that talks about the neighborhood structure. So the neighborhood structure is like in, in Nakuru, informal settlement of Bondeni, Ronda, and um, places like Kivumbini. We have family disruptions, we have uh, poverty, and uh, such instances have helped to surge um, the number of people who are in the, these criminal gangs because they try to fend for themselves, like Joyce said uh, in the video. Also, we have substructural theory. And ad, under substructural theory, we have substructural violence and substructure of poverty, yeah? So we have a lot of youths, a lot of young people have revolved around um, um, poverty, around crime, and they have role models in the informal settlements who are, who are, are, are criminals, who are ganged down, yeah? And these are people they look up to. And that is why we have many youths in Nakuru particularly uh, joining the confirmed gang because they look up to people these are their mentors, yeah? These are the role models they look up to. And it is very prestigious, quote unquote, to belong to a criminal gang for protection purposes. And then the last one is the conflict theory. And this, is, um, this comes to disparity in income distribution, comes to unemployment, and levels of unemployment, uh, income distribution, we have a uh, population yeah, uh, density. Now that Nakuru is a city, we expect more, more people to join these criminal gangs. Yeah? And uh, coming to your question, uh, Jerry, our great panelist, how we can use art to, to curb um, such is through the revolution of the mindset, one because we say the intention is not to change the world, but to spark the mind that will change the world because true leadership is in delegation. So when we indulge more youths into art, into spoken word, into writing, into, into, into music, into, in, in, into, into acting, now they channel that energy somewhere and they find a, legit, a legitimate way of, of making money, a legitimate way uh, of, 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 of looking up to legitimate role models in a very good way, in a moral way, yeah? Because once we said in the informal settlements, these youths have role models who are criminals. Some are dead, some are alive. Now, 
when we indulge these youths into art, into spoken word, they will find new role models. They will spend their energy, their time, and they will earn from it, yeah? And, and, and also the implementation of policies as, as the gentleman who is a victim of the confirm uh, activities in Nakuru said, when these uh, youths are uh, arrested by the police, there is no cap in the constitution, there's no clause in the constitution that binds them. So they are released probably the same day. And we have interference by the politicians because these youths are vulnerable. So indulging these youths into art and art activities will really go a long way into one, first uh, revolutionize their mindset and two, channel their energy somewhere else, somewhere else and three, give them proper role models, give them proper examples of other youths who are inside these gangs, youths who are inside these criminal gangs, youths who are inside these informal settlements, when they make it, then it will give them a true ex examples of good moral role models. For example, there's a youth who is going to Manchester from Kivumbini and Manchester United, the football club. And I'm sure this is one of the many steps that will see forth these youths to see another side of making it other than crime, other than confirm, other than snatching phones. Because right now, the confirm gang is slowly, um, uh, uh, slowly being now a very dangerous uh, theft gang now because they are stealing, they are using force, they are using machetes and, 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 and pangas. And it's not good because Safaricom and the telecommunication agencies and the government right now is very, they have updated their security systems and now they are resorting to now physical crime. So if youths indulge in art, now that will be a very huge step into, coming, in, into curbing the criminal activities in Nakuru and in Kenya. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joeba. That was uh, amazing and congratulations on your, on your award. We hope that it will take you to greater heights. Now you'll allow me to introduce our, our last panelist. Our last panelist is Jeski Mani. Jeski Mani is the global initiative against transnational organized, uh, organized crime, East and Horn of Africa Observer, Observatory Coordinator and the Resilience Fund liaison person and is based in Nairobi, Kenya. An investigative journalist by profession Jace works in areas of human trafficking and smuggling, drug trafficking, and flora and fauna crime. So Joyce Karibusana, I have a question for you. Uh, what, what, what do you think are the initiative that, that the, CEO, the CSOs, like the, like the Resilience Fund, can do to deal with the gang problem? Karibu. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was talking on my phone. Was, uh, my my edit on mute. Uh, thank you so much, Njeri Kimani, for this opportunity. Uh, good afternoon from Nairobi, Kenya. And this 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 topic is really close to my heart because just yesterday, and I think uh, I posted it on my social media channels. I, I spent the, the day at the police station because I realized that someone was impersonating me and uh, was asking for money and was calling all my friends and sending them through my, my a strange number. I think someone went and, and picked a SIM card, uh, decided it was me, so started sending people messages. Uh, someone, they were asking for help. Uh, Others were being told we can be friends, and you know it became so strange because people started calling me and asking me, uh, "Why are you asking us for money? Why are you asking us for this and this and this?" And it came as a shock to me because I didn't know I needed money or I needed uh, uh, I needed people to come through for me. 
And so yesterday I had to go through the process. I went to the police and I reported it and it became something interesting because now the police are looking for the person who is impersonating me. But this was just like an introduction to how damaging the effects of these guns are. And when I look at it from the point of um, the power that these guns have, uh, being part of the documentary and you know, having exchanges to this, uh, with these guns, it made me realize that there, there exists a very huge gap in dealing with this gun problem. Uh, one of the things that really came up when we were doing the documentary is the divide. Is the divide between um, what we are doing and what is actually on the ground. Uh, when we got to the ground and we get to talk to these guns, we realized that uh, most of them are actually there. Some of them do not really want to be there. For me, the documentary, the one sentence that really stands out is when that gang member says, a family journalist. Uh, and when I looked at him and when I talked to him, and I realized that this is someone who has really tried everything. Because when we were talking to them, uh, one of them was saying, he's worked in different ministries of foreign affairs, he's gone to for foreign jobs in the UAE and came back. And so for him to resort to a gang, I think it was his last option. And this brings to the point of uh, this brings me to the point of what we can do, uh, both as uh, civil society, as uh, as civil society, as uh, uh, people in Nakuru, uh, New York City, as uh, these wonderful people who are winning awards. Congratulations, them! I forgot to say that. Uh, and uh, looking at the synergies and looking at uh, the interesting points where we can come in. When I focus on confirm and I focus on other guns. Uh, I, I work a lot in the semi-urban settlements uh, under the resilience fund. And one of the things we try is to look into ways where we can, you know, interrupt this gun, gun market by number one, creating opportunities for people who are either in guns or are looking for way out of guns. So I believe that one of the approaches that civil society, we as civil society and we as members of the public can do is come, coming up with uh, countermeasures for the guns. Beatrice mentioned something very really interesting, and we've seen it. But uh, these guns, some of them are just looking for soft skills. Uh, we we went to when you go to the ground, these people are looking for issues like uh, they want um, uh, maybe a training training in uh, mechanics, uh, mechanic, be a mechanic, even want uh, driving skills so that they can be able to get uh, a job in the legal way, uh, a legal job perhaps. Uh, one of the people we interviewed also, and I think he was part of the next documentary, part of the next documentary, is really a talented photographer. And they were like, if you can help us develop this skill, we are going to leave this, uh, we're going to leave this problem and venture more into using our skills and talents to earn money. And I find it interesting that uh, there are no systems that are there where this, uh, these people can be able to explore that talent. So this is where I find uh, Art for Right and I find um, Midrift Hurinet and I find Oeba. There is an opportunity for us to synergize and come up with uh, maybe better ideas and better platforms where we can bring together these youth. Oeba coming in with his spoken word, Beatrice teaching these uh, youth uh, issues to do with uh, human rights. And uh, maybe resilience fund coming in and helping them uh, start up uh, projects that are sustainable. This is one of the ways we can look into the gun problem. And I feel like um, it is it is an open invitation. Uh, one of the other areas where I think uh, is really important is looking at uh, how we can partner with uh, government, uh, especially county government, because when it comes to devolution. We, we have to accept that some of these gangs also uh, became part of the devolution. The, our gangs in Kenya are more into geographical locations. For example, the way CONFIRM is really in operation in Nakuru, we have some which are operating in Gaza. Uh, we have Gaza operating in Fayole, and then we have uh, the Songo Songos operating, I think, in Western Kenya. We have individual gangs who like resorted to their geographical area as a result of the devolution, in my view. And so they need to look into county governments and to work with the county governments, the local governments, and discuss on ways how we can be able to work with, come up with tailor-made solutions that will help deal that problem with the problem. 
In Nakuru, for example, uh, the county government, as is mentioned before, they need to come up with a charter to deal with the confirmed gun because the confirmed gun is mainly uh, focusing on cyber crime. And uh, one of the loopholes we've seen is there is no law, especially at a, at a county level, where these people can be charged in the law courts. So my, my approach would be maybe having conversation with the county government who uh, have been really helpful and they've been really supportive in, in dealing with the confirmed problem, uh, in coming up with the ideas of how to deal with them. So I, I feel like we need, we as civil society need to go to different areas. We map out the places and we ask, we talk to the people on the ground and we ask for solutions from them because even when we are engaging parents, uh, people who, of people of parents of children who are in gangs, they were the ones who were telling us uh, one of the things we could do is, for example, go to schools, uh, go to primary schools, look out for these uh, clubs, uh, 4K clubs and environmental clubs and keep these youth engaged. And so it became really interesting. It became really interesting to see how we, we can also work uh, with people on the ground, the partners on the ground, the youth on the ground, so that they can be able to help us uh, come up with solutions. I think I would I wouldn't like to end this conversation without saying that uh, civil society is has become more of a reactive instead of a preventive uh, mechanism. So we are not looking at solutions. We are dealing with the we are not looking. We become more of looking into the problem as it has emerged. And this is the confirmed gun is running faster than we are we are we are running at the rate. So and the, these are well. They, they have a lot of money. They have a lot of. They have a lot of uh, access. They have a lot of power because if they can control the police system, which we've seen them do, they're controlling who will be the OCS, who will be the. Uh, Joyce. They control their funding political. So, so I think I'll have to cut you. Can I can I just throw in my last word? So I think I think it's also important to bring together we. We look into how we are going to work together as civil society. Thank you. I see Jay had a lot to say, but yeah, uh, time time is not on our side. We 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 have very few minutes left, and I want to open the floor for for questions. Kindly, if you're in the in the room and you have a question, you can ask, or I can read the ones that have been dropped. I, I think from the chat box, I see I have a question for Beatrice. Uh, Beatrice, uh, how, how, how can we break the cycle of recruitment? Okay. There's someone who has asked how we can break the cycle. The cycle of recruitment. I think, I think uh, for recruitment of confirm, it starts from an early age. And especially you see they target children from uh, from primary school, that is uh, the the oldest in primary school is fourteen or thirteen. So you can imagine how how that goes. So at the end of the day, we need to target children and bring them together for them to be able to make better decisions for their lives. You see, it's all about decision making. Another thing is maybe implementing the laws and policies that are already there for us to prevent this from going on. Another thing is also creating employment or empowering youth with skills to be able to legitimately earn their, their, their living. Another thing, there are so many other things that we can do. And also uh, parenting, you see, parenting is also another push factor. Cause you see when poor parenting is in place, children feel obligated to take care of the children, of the, of the parents. So at the end of the day, if you're not taking care of your parents, it's like you're failing. So such things we need to be able to put in place. There's also the mental health uh, awareness, like we bring them together, encourage youth or even children who've gone through advanced childhood uh, experiences to go for therapy sessions because it helps them at the end of the day. So there are so many things that we can do together, partnership and partnership in this sense, midriff partners with Arts for Rights. Uh, at for rights partners with Youth Villanoma so that we do not duplicate what each individual organization is doing for us to reinforce the activities that we have for the 
for the best interest of the community and also maybe uh, involving the government. And I don't know how we are going to do this, the police brutality and how we can work with this IPOA, the independent police uh, your, or authority, that one. I think we need to bring in government institutions. We need to bring in CSOs, the, the local government for us to work together for this. Because at the end of the day, like when, we, when the Kazim Tani comes in, the chiefs and maybe the, the local chiefs and assistant chiefs prioritizes people from their own community or maybe let's say from their own family. So we are ab if we are able to be in talks with them, to be able to provide employment for these uh, reformed gang members. And we make, we make a life outside there, like in the legal way, okay, the legal way to be more attractive for the youth. Because at the end of the day, when they see someone who's struggling, earning, earning, a, earning a living out of a, a legal, legal thing, it becomes really hard for them to say, I ule mwingine na patado, in a very simple way, na ule mwingine na struggle, na, na lifestyle yaki kuchini badu. So we really need to bring in together, bring people together and work for the, be, for the best uh, of the community, for the best interest of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Beatrice has decided to talk in Kiswahili, but it's all right. <laughs> Sorry I, for I that. think some of the members have not understood, but it's all right. I think in in two minutes, Mwini, uh, I would like, I'd like you to uh, to address how is the government supportive of your efforts uh, when it comes to to working with the with the gang members? Do you get any support? Yeah, to some extent, the government is supportive, but uh, to some extent, it's not supportive. Uh, uh, but speaking on the gains, they've been supporting us uh, in working closely with those that want to disen disengage from the groups, from the gangs, and also in terms of maybe those uh, who want to maybe go back to school, uh, the school drop -offs. Uh They've been supporting us and uh, even through the empowerment uh, session, our empowerment workshops, our empowerment opportunities, they've been supporting because uh, they write a recommendation letter to some of them so that they can be accepted to some rehabilitation centers. Some of them were, were accepted to go back to school. And also some of them who are reformed, they were accepted back to community. Uh, but uh, with support from the government. And again, speaking about the gains, they also, uh, uh, they've been engaging young people, like tomorrow, they are going to come to Bondemi to talk to them, to hear their grievances, what uh, maybe the, the challenges they are facing, and a way forward so that they can be good agents of passing positive narrative to the community. But on the other hand, in terms of policies and implement, uh, implementations, our county government has been doing little to support the initiative. Like uh, some of the reformed uh, groups, like the Kazi Clean, the one that I'm managing, they are working towards uh, restoring our ecosystem, but the county government, they refused to work with them because sometimes they don't want even to give them the tenders because already they tabled their papers. They know these people, they are vulnerable. They don't have the right skills to maybe to write that A plus uh, concept. So we need to understand them. We understand their level of literacy so that even they do not meet, if they do not meet the threshold for qualification, they need to look how maybe they can support them. Even they can be taken as uh, cleaners, city cleaners, already we are a city. They can be sweeping our city. And that's a way of empowering them. And again, the government, uh, they've been doing little to support them because through Kazim Tani, they, they only employed those who have the IDs because you will see that some of those who are engaging in crime, they don't have the IDs. Some of them, even they are Muslims. They will, went ahead even to join terrorist organizations because here in Kenya, some of them go under long process of vetting process and some of them are Kikuyus but they have Muslim names. So the government needs to identify their people. They need to identify these are the youth. They are the ones who are causing these troubles and to work with them. 
But uh, thank you also as an organization we've been pushing for the government at least to incorporate those in art, those who are engaged in crime. And uh, we've been seeing good efforts and good success. And uh, I believe in the future. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the OC24 podcast. For more talks, have a look at the podcast feed on whichever platform you use. There are loads more to listen to. Video versions of these talks are also available on the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime YouTube channel. If you would like to share these talks around, we ask that you use the hashtag OC24 and let us know what you think. The 24-hour conference on global organised crime is brought to you by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group on Organised Crime, the Centre for Information and Research on Organised Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organised Crime, and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. For more information, head over to oc24.globalinitiative.net. This has been the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Thanks for listening.